In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of directional derivatives and the gradient. We're going to focus on some geometric interpretations of the gradient vector. So how does the gradient relate to the direction of the greatest increase or decrease? Well, remember our basic formula for the dot product, the dot product of two vectors, a dot b, is the same as the length of a times the length of b times the cosine of the angle between those two vectors. So our directional derivative is defined in terms of a dot product. So let's apply that formula. That means that the directional derivative of f in the direction of u would be the length of the gradient vector times the length of u times cosine theta. Well, u is a unit vector, so that just simplifies to the length of the gradient vector times cosine theta. So that tells me that really uh, the rate of change depends on two things. The magnitude of the gradient vector and the angle between the gradient vector and the direction vector u. Now, remember that cosine varies between negative 1 and positive 1. So this rate of change will be maximum when cosine of theta equals 1. That occurs when theta equals 0. It'll be minimum when cosine of theta equals negative 1. And it will be zero if cosine of theta equals zero. And that occurs when theta is pi over two or the direction vector is orthogonal to the gradient vector. So when theta equals zero, what can we say about the gradient vector and the direction vector? They must be pointing in the same direction. When theta equals pi, we can say that the direction vector must be in the opposite direction of the gradient vector. So our greatest rate of change, the largest possible value of this directional derivative is the magnitude of the gradient vector. And that is going to occur when you're going in the direction, the same direction, as the gradient vector. The angle between the gradient vector and the direction vector is zero. The smallest rate of change is going to be the opposite of the magnitude of the gradient vector, and that's going to occur in the direction which is opposite the gradient vector. And I didn't put it here in the slide, but the rate of change will be zero when the direction is orthogonal to the gradient vector. So that brings us to the connection between the gradient vector and level curves. If you're on a level curve of a surface, the height or elevation or the z value does not change. That's why it's called a level curve. It has the same height. The direction of steep at ascent, so in other words, if you want to make z change the most, you should go in the direction of the gradient vector. If you want it to change uh, the least or to have the go down the most, put it that way, you go in the opposite direction of the gradient vector. And if you don't want to change it at all, you stay on the level curve. Now remember we said that if the uh, direction is orthogonal to the gradient, that's when the rate of change is zero. And so we can conclude that the gradient vector must be orthogonal to the level curve. So if I look at some of my level curves from a contour map, if I'm at a point here and I want to go in the direction of the steepest ascent at that point, then I should go orthogonal 
to the level curve, which will be in the direction of the gradient. Now, this may seem a little counterintuitive. It seems like if you wanted to go in the direction of the steepest ascent, you should just go straight towards the top. But we're talking about locally, right there at that point. In which direction would you go at that point in order to have your rate of change maximum? It may only be maximum for a few feet, and then it's going to change into another direction. But at that point, the direction of the gradient is going to give you the steepest ascent. So just as an aside, streams and rivers are always going to be flowing orthogonal to level curves. So if I look at here, I have a uh, 3D view of a, some hills with a valley here and then a stream running down the the hill. Well, that stream, if I look at it, is always going to be perpendicular or orthogonal to the level curve. And then in this valley, the water is going to flow again perpendicular to the level curves. And that actually makes perfect sense. Water is going to flow in the direction of the steepest descent, which would be the opposite of the gradient, which would be orthogonal to the level curves. Now, if we have a function of three variables, remember that its graph is a four-dimensional object, and we don't have any uh, way of, of visualizing that. But what we can do is, instead of having level curves, a, a, this function of three variables can have level surfaces. And just at, like the gradient for the uh, for a function of two variables is going to be orthogonal to a level curve, the gradient of a function of three variables will be orthogonal to a level surface. So what would the gradient be? Well, again, it's just the uh, vector that ha of the partial derivatives. It has three components now because now it has a partial of f with respect to z, but it's the same idea. And um, if we set the function value to be a constant, we get that notion of a level surface, and the gradient vector is going to be orthogonal to the level surface. So if I have a function and its level surface, a particular level surface is this ellipsoid, at this point, on the level surface, the gradient is going to be orthogonal to that surface. Now, what exactly does it mean for the gradient to be orthogonal to the level surface? Uh, it means that the gradient vector is orthogonal to the tangent plane at that point on the surface, uh, which means that the gradient vector could serve as a normal vector for the tangent plane. And that gives us a, a simple way of coming up with the equation of a plane. If we know the point on the level surface, we know the gradient vector, then we could use an equation of this form or any of the other forms. We now know the normal vector components from the partial derivatives, and then we also are given the point x naught, y naught, and z naught. So, for example, if I'm given this function of three variables, 4yz minus 6xz plus 2xy, and I pick a point, 3 comma 1 comma 2, what is uh, an equation of the uh, I, I needed to write an equation of the tangent plane? So let me go ahead and fix that. So I really needed to say of the plane tangent to 
the level surface at the point 3 comma 1 comma 2. So I'll need to put that in all the next slides. So bear with me. We'll make this correction on the following slides then. So I'll need the partial derivative. So let me, um, the partial with respect to x, y, and z, that'll give me the gradient vector. So I'd first take the partial with respect to x, I'll have to evaluate that. at the point 3, 1, 2, so x equals 3, y equals 1, and z equals 2. I get negative 2 from that. Partial with respect to y is this expression. And I'll have to evaluate that at 3, 1, 2. I get 14. And then finally, the partial with respect to z, I'll have to evaluate that at 3, 1, 2. And I get positive 6. So now, I have my x0, y0, and z0. I have my normal vector components, or negative 10. 14 and 6, so I can write down the equation of the tangent plane. And I could clean that up a little bit, put it in a, the form that we're used to seeing. In our second example, we're going to try to find the rate of change of this uh, function, w equals radical x, y, z, so it's a function of three variables, in the direction of v, which has components negative 1, negative 2, and 2, at the point 3, comma 2, comma 6. So we want a directional derivative of f in the direction of a unit vector in the same direction as v. So again, we really always have to, to emphasize that our directional derivative requires a unit vector. And it's not hard. If we're given a vector, we just take the vector, divide it by its magnitude. And well, now we have a unit vector in the same direction. So the magnitude of v is just 1, radical 1 plus 4 plus 4, so radical 9, that is 3. I need the gradient vector, so let's uh, take the partial of w with respect to x. I'll write uh, the x, y, z, radical x, y, z as x, y, z to the 1 half power, use the power rule, and then use the chain rule the partial derivative of the inside with respect to x is just y, z. And I'll write that then as y, z over 2 radical x, y, z. And using the same technique, I can find that the partial of w with respect to y is going to have the same denominator but x, z on the top. And the partial of w with respect to z still has the same denominator but x, y on top. So I could actually factor the 1 over 2 radical x, y, z, and write the gradient vector as 1 over 2 radical x, y, z factored out in front of a vector with components y, z, x, z, and x, y. And I'm only interested in this gradient vector at the point 3, comma 2, comma 6. So replacing those values for x, y, and z, I get the following vector, and I'm going to write that, even though it has some fractions, I'm going to go ahead and write that as 1 comma 3 halves comma 1 half. So I've got my gradient vector, I've got my unit vector, 
I just need their dot product now. So if I take the dot product of the gradient uh, with my unit vector u, um, just carefully perform the arithmetic, I get negative 1. In our last example, we'd like to find the maximum rate of change of the function f of x comma y equals cosine of x y at the point 1 comma pi over 2. So maximum rate of change, that's going to be a scalar. It's going to be some number. And so we'd like to know the direction in which it occurs. So uh, we learned earlier in this video that the direction in which it occurs has to be the same direction as the gradient vector. So when we say the direction, really we're talking about a vector which points in that same direction. So the max rate of change is going to be the magnitude of the gradient vector at that point. So let's go ahead and find the gradient vector. I need the partial derivatives, the partial of f with respect to x. Uh, when I take the derivative of the cosine, I get negative sine. And then I have to apply the chain rule and I'll have a multiplier of y that comes out from the chain rule. Evaluate that when x equals 1 and uh, y equals pi over 2. And uh, I'm going to get, well, sine of pi over 2 is 1. So that just gets multiplied by negative y, giving me negative pi over 2. The partial with respect to y, again, Derivative of cosine is negative sine, but then I apply the chain rule, so I get a multiplier of x out in front when I take the partial derivative with respect to y. Evaluate that when x equals 1 and y equals pi over 2. And so then I get, uh, well, negative x, which would just be negative 1. So now I just have to calculate the magnitude of that gradient vector. So just the square root of the sum of the squares. Can't really simplify this any further. I just have to leave it as radical pi squared over 4 plus 1. And the direction in which it occurs is the direction of the gradient vector, which is the vector with components negative pi over 2 and negative 1. And so over here, I went ahead and used some technology to plot this surface, the graph of this function here. And um, at, when, at the point 1 comma pi over 2, uh, the z value is actually 0. So this is actually in the xy plane. And the direction of the arrow points in the direction of the gradient. So locally right there, uh, even though this is going to have its peak above the origin, at that point, the direction of steepest ascent is moving in the direction of the, that red arrow right there. So th there's some useful information then about the direction of steepest ascent, the direction of steepest descent, and all that information is stored in the gradient vector.